Uh, so thanks very much, and um, I know I'm the, the last speaker before the reflection, which is the most important bit, so I'll try and shorten some of mine as well. Um, but thanks very much for the invitation, um, uh, really grateful to be here. And I suppose I'm the last, I guess, I guess, bit of the jigsaw in terms of the work that we do. So while we've heard from practitioners and also from the policy side, the research side is really what I'm going to be talking about. And I think we need all of those bits to be able to support our work. So whether it's you know your work informing our research or our research informing practice and also policy. And we all often need those um, key bits to be able to, I suppose, leverage support for our work, to also say this does work and here is the evidence. Particularly if you're looking for funding or you're looking for someone or you're looking for change maybe, you've got someone, you've got the, the evidence to support it. And it's not just, well, I know it works. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is just a bit of background about myself. I'm not going to uh, talk um, about myself, but I suppose my expertise is more in child and adolescent health. I'm particularly doing some work on preschools. Well, even um, earlier years, like we or earlier than that, weaning um, practices at preschools. A bit about fussy eating, which I'll talk a little bit about today, and also a project on food portions. And I'm going to talk a bit about, about well, more about fussy eating um, rather than food portions today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about. I'm going to focus on the family style meal services, uh, which we've been the focus a lot of today's work. Um, but before I do that, I suppose I'll talk a little bit about um, early years as a setting for health promotion. And I guess this is sort of maps on to, um, to Marissa's um, slides uh, before, before mine, which is talking, I suppose, about the context of development, that obviously things don't happen in isolation. And so we try our best for when our children are either in the setting or at home or in our community, but they obviously all inter interconnect. Um, and that's quite important when we're looking at development, looking at trying to encourage or empower um, or looking at choice for healthy behaviours um, and recognising that. So I talk a little bit about early years as a health promotion or as a setting for health promotion. So some people may have children even in schools like primary or secondary schools which are a setting called a setting for health promotion. They're called a health promoting school. And there's been less work in the early year setting around a health promotion, health promoting uh, setting. But I think we have lots of um, reasons to do it. And the setting is often underpinned by these sort of five action areas in health promotion. And one of them is about creating a supportive environment. And I think this links very much back to the topic of the, the seminar and the work that has been going on over the last few months, which is about enabling. So um, enabling children to choose maybe a healthier product or to go outside and to run around if that's what they want to do. And that supportive environment, I suppose, in terms of health promotion is really that, that the healthy choice should be the easier choice and it shouldn't be a number of different barriers coming up against us. Um, I think linked to that as well in early years, we talk about developing, per or we can link this to developing personal skills, which is whether that's about learning about, you know, washing up, learning about passing, learning social skills, emotional skills, and things that we need for life. For them to be school ready often, um, it is as well. And just touching on the building healthy public policy, so this might be at the broader level, at government level and trickle down but also relates to policy, I suppose, in your own setting. Um, and we talked a little bit before about having a policy and communicating that with parents or developing it in consultation with parents actually might get, get more buy-in as well. Um, so we may see over the years looking at um, early year settings having what's not necessarily a flag, like a green flag for the environment, but can be actually, um, I guess, designated as a health promoting setting. I think that would be, that would be quite nice. So I'm not going to talk too much about why diet is important. Um, I guess a lot of us know unhealthy eating, certainly the evidence is very strong linked to a lot of chronic diseases. Overweight and obesity is obviously you know, um, very topical and uh, important for the government and there's a lot of work um, and a lot of funding I guess going behind uh, trying to reduce overweight and obesity. Um, I guess the reason that we look at the early years, um, children who are in early years is promoting healthy behaviours at that stage, we know that they contract to adulthood and not leaving it much later when habits are much more difficult to change. Um, so that's why now there's a much a greater focus on the early years. Um, but I guess what's really important, and I think it links back to, to the seminar and some of the work that the practitioners have been presenting, is that food is not just about nutrition. 
Um, yes, that's a key point or a key, a, a key aspect of it, but it's also, it's a tool or it's a route for learning. So whether that's around mealtime, sitting together, taking a bit of time, passing, it's learning about cooking, whether that's measurement, what happens when something is cooked, it looks different, it tastes different, it smells different, you know, spinach, when it's actually cooked, it looks very different. Um, where the food is coming from, you know, how do I grow it? These are all opportunities um, that we can use food for. So it's not just necessarily they need to eat all their fruit and vegetables, but it's where is it grown? What kind of uh, temperature does it need? Uh, how do I peel this? All of those things are um, opportunities for learning and to have fun and to play. <laughs> so in terms of child nutrition, um, what, I, what I suppose I want to talk about here is parents probably talk to practitioners are probably more concerned about undernutrition or indeed, you know, they're not growing enough, they're not as um, in line maybe with, um, you know, their peers, and they might be worried about that, maybe more so than they're worried about dental health or even overweight and obesity. But we need to, I suppose, monitor both. Both, both need to be looked at. And it's rare, I suppose, that children do have poor nutritional status. Yes, they can be at risk of certain uh, nutrient deficiencies, um, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. But I think, early on in the early years, it's those feeding and the eating experiences that actually shape dietary preferences. And that's what's really key, so that we want them to be able to choose a variety of foods, not to be fearful of certain foods or not to have too narrow a range. And that can all start in the early years. Um, and I think they learn about what they like and don't like by touching it, uh, by smelling it, um, by looking at how it changes, um, by seeing other people eating it, and that can be the staff versus versus their children as well. And Sinead mentioned earlier a little bit about, um, I suppose, attitude to food and sort of good and bad foods. And it's one of the things, I guess, we're trying to um, promote more, it's okay, um, is that there is a positive relationship with food. Um, and that it's seen as something, yes, I'm hungry, I need to eat some food, I like this, and maybe I don't like this as much, or how do I cook and so forth. But that it's not, we're not, um, or trying to avoid an emotional response to food. So it's not a way of regulating our emotions. And I suppose that's what sometimes like, you know, if a child falls and then they're given a biscuit or <coughs> if they're upset or told, if you eat your vegetables, you can have, you know, your treat. Trying not to do those kind of things because it, it, um, the relationships get a bit uh, skewed, I suppose. Now, the, the research in terms of emotional eating for young children or what, what I'll term preschool children is only sort of, you know, um, growing, it's, 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 there's not that much there. But we certainly do see it in, in adolescents and, and in adults as well. Um, so this just goes through some of the nutrients that uh, young people can be deficient in. Um, I'm not going to, 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 to delve into it because I don't think we have much time, um, but they'll be there in the slides if people are interested um, again. Um, so the reason, I guess, early years are sort of, I suppose, um, a prime time or opportunity to be able to encourage or empower children to, 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 to choose the healthy food, food is they consume a lot of, obviously, their meals at a preschool or the earlier setting. If they're there the full time, it could be up to 70% of their daily nutrient intake. But I think, importantly, our parents often look to practi practitioners for help. Um, and to try and say, well, will you try and get them to eat the broccoli or will you try and get them to eat the spinach? Um, and practitioners can take advantage of that as well and say, well, we did this today and this worked really well, just sharing the knowledge. Um, because education is only one thing, you know, telling someone you need to eat more fruit and veg, that doesn't really, that's not enough, that just, it, it stops dead there really. Changing our behavior is much more difficult. Um, and I think also in the early years, practitioners, as we've seen already and has been demonstrated in the, in the lovely videos, they, ha they provide the opportunity for children to learn to like a variety of foods. So I'm just going to mention responsive feeding because it links to the family style service. So responsive feeding, really what that means, it's, it's like a reciprocal relationship between the child and the caregiver. So that the child is able to communicate, and that might be verbally or non-verbally, that they're hungry or indeed that they're full and the caregiver responds. Now there's been probably more work and people are probably more familiar with it when it comes to you know, infants as in either breastfeeding or formula feeding, um, but it's, it also it links into the family style um, uh, practices as well. So the, the research is sort of saying when children are given little control over how much they eat, they're less likely to eat in response to hunger or to stop eating when they're full. So that self-regulation is, is being dampened down 
And you mean, it's very interesting, I suppose the school children were talking about, they gave me too much, or you know, I'd prefer a little bit more of the sauce and less of the pasta or whatever. Um, but also this responsive feeding, it promotes behaviors like that they're, they're tuned into, um, uh, or they're more interested in the food than when it is served. They're tuned into their internal cues of hunger and fullness. Um, they're capable of communicating, you know, whether that's crying for a very young infant or, you know, telling the, the, the caregiver, you know, going up and saying, oh, I'm hungry now. This is what I, I need something to eat. And it also can lead to the independent feeding as well, particularly when we look at young, young infant or young children. And responsive feeding, one of the ways of feeding children or uh, getting this reciprocal relationship is through family style meal service. Um, so I don't need to go through what it is. Obviously, they're serving themselves. They're taking their own um, you know, portions of food. And it's communal dishes and, and pictures on, on the table. Um, and the idea is that they're, they're taking the portions in response to how hungry they feel or leaving it if, if, they're, if they're satiated or if they're full. And the idea is it encourages that self-regulation. But also, it's about socialization. So it's about that talking that, that you are presenting. They're talking to each other. They're talking to the staff. Uh, their, their fine motor skills can be um, improved because they're picking up things, pictures, or, or forks, or tongs, should I say. But also, this, the, the evidence behind it, it's a widely endorsed practice right from the US across to Ireland and beyond, because the evidence is strong of the benefits um, of it. And one of the reasons it's strong is that we have this modeling of eating together. Now, I know earlier they talked a little bit about they try and get the staff to eat a little bit. Um, but, uh, and that is, that is, I suppose, part of the family style dining, that the staff eat together with the children. So the child can see the staff eating the broccoli or the, the sauce or whatever it is. Um, and they also watch each other. So there's peer modeling, staff modeling, peer modeling. It, it helps you, um, or it helps practitioners or parents, if they're doing it as well, to avoid that pressuring the child to finish what's on the plate, or indeed restricting access to certain foods. So everyone is getting the same. Everybody has an opportunity to take enough, to take what they would like. Um, because those very restrictive feeding practices um, uh, also negatively impact on that self-regulation. Um, and indeed, this, this last study there, they, they looked at, um, I guess, earlier settings that had this family style meal service versus those that didn't. And they could see that, you know, they have evidence there that the, that the children were more, more likely to try those new foods. But the talking amongst each other and amongst uh, the staff was very evident as well. So we have evidence there. And this is just, I guess, an, over, an overview of some of the outcomes. So we're seeing that the children, uh, that they can practice their social skills, their motor skills. This is backed up by some of that research. That the preschool children um, who served themselves, they wasted less food and they ate 25% less than the children who were served pre plated meals. Now, this is over time. These things take time to change. We're not expecting all of a sudden that everybody, this is going to happen magically. It certainly takes time. But also that it supported that self-regulation um, and importantly, some, some researchers are suggesting that that self-regulation, it can diminish by the age of five. So that might mean that those early years are critical in trying to encourage and let children um, self-regulate. So they know, I'm hungry, and now I've had enough. I don't want any more. <coughs> and it wouldn't be the same every day anyway for, for, for a child. Obviously, it depends how active they are, um, you know, all the different contexts that, we've, that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to skip over that because that's just internationally looking at uh, what some of the, we'll say, preschools from the US to Australia to the Netherlands are doing. Um, but just to mention, I suppose, th those international studies, some of the preschools found it difficult uh, to have non-food treats or not maybe celebrations that weren't based around food or um, particularly having difficulty either identifying or getting the ch children to determine when they're hungry. And I think that is a hard one, and uh, you know, we don't necessarily have the answer for that. Um, and I'm not going to focus on the Irish one as well. So what I'd like to, to, to just um, show you, this is an overview of a study which was done in the US. It was based in Illinois. So it was a qualitative study, interviews with practitioners, um, basically half who were using family-style meal service and half who were not. And so it is a full daycare, essentially, and the meals are provided by the service. So some of them are different from what your experiences are. 
um, but they analyze the data thematically. And I'm just going to present some of it. So this is not obviously my work, it's some, somebody else's. But I think it maps on very nicely to some of the um, presentations you've had already from the practitioners, and indeed maybe some of the sort of uh, challenges people are having in their minds about, can I do this? So the way I have it laid out is, these are the motivators for family style dining. So these are the practitioners who are implementing it. And these are the reasons, this is what motivated them to do it. That there was more pleasant meal times, it allowed for self-regulation. The children, all the things I've said, helped uh, develop self-help skills, they learned social skills, the modeling, but also they said it was part of their curriculum as well. Now the next slide is basically um, quotes from the practitioners that support these sort of themes that were found. So for example, the pleasant meal times, um, the children can say yes and no instead of the food being put on their plate, causing distress if something is on their plate they don't like. Um, so they will know how much they want and how much they don't want, and they don't waste food. Um, the kids learn how to scoop and use the tongs to get their food and put it on their plate. And uh, this one isn't a quote, but they were talking about patience and turn taking and sharing and passing food and so forth. And again, about the um, they're sitting down and we're talking about food. If they see you eating it, they'll try it. So this is about the modeling of, uh, of the food. And I guess this is about the talking bit. Um, so this is not about the curriculum. We talk about our day and stuff like that. This is sometimes the only time that they get to talk about things like that. So here again, it comes back to the, I guess, the overarching theme of space and time, time to do that. Uh, time to sit down and actually talk. And there was some nice talking going on in the videos that, um, that, they were, that were shown earlier. So these, were th these are the, um, I guess, the themes from the practitioners that are not using the family style um, meal service or family style dining. So some of the barriers, that it's difficult to change. So change is difficult for all of us. If you're at home, even in your own house, and you want to do something, change something, it's always difficult. Messy and unhygienic, this is the practitioner's perception of it that it would be resource inten intensive and the belief that children cannot self-regulate or that they would select inappropriate portion sizes um, and that children are just, they're too young. So this was some of the practitioners, um, these are the themes coming out from those interviews, those that were not um, doing the family style service. And so these are some of the quotes, um, basically saying the change would be too big. So it's almost like I cannot do it. Um, this one is, you know, he's lying there picking his nose. Do you really want his hand in the container <laughs> before he puts his hand, uh, before he hands it to the next buddy? Here's the chips and my germs. So this idea, well, obviously a concern for a practitioner, you know, uh, and it, th these are things, these are barriers that would have to be overcome. I mean, you look at cost-wise for buying extra bowls and the big spoons and all of that extra, and I know we've only got one cook. Who's going to do all the dishes and all the ordering? Um, uh, Over-serving, they've talked about leaving inadequate food for others, only eating what they like, not eating enough. So this is the challenges around, and I think this is very, it, it maps on very well to some of the practitioners and what they're sharing, that there is concern, somebody's not having enough and they're going to be hungry later, what will I do then? Or they're having too much. Um, if everyone wants a lot of chicken, some won't get any. <laughs> Um, and this is about being too young. They're too, it will be a real mess. It's just easier for us to line up the plates to put the veg on. Um, so, but we saw from the videos that actually, you know, at very young, they're even able to, to clean up and, and to tidy up afterwards. But this was a nice, um, you know, study to show, I guess it's the, the evidence behind what you're, what you're experiences, experiencing um, as well. So how to overcome some of the, 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 these barriers, I guess, those uh, practitioners who were implementing the family style came up with some facilitators maybe to overcome some of the barriers. Uh, so these were the barriers that we'd, uh, I just mentioned. And they, they were saying, if you keep doing it over and over, the children will get it. They will eventually get it. Start with a snack. And I think some of the services have, have done that. They've started with the, OK, just the snack time. Um, have them help clean up the mess, and they'll eventually get it. It takes a while, but they do. Um, serve themselves during the playtime, so using the fake food or the sandbox game. So they're practicing the things of pouring and moving and passing and, and tongs and so forth. If you sit and do family style, you won't feel like you have to get up as much. And if they need help, you just hand over things. It's not as hard to be up running around doing things. So you have this, this idea that it's too resource intensive. And in fact, they're saying it's, it's actually the opposite. 
Um, we have it prepared in enough portions for all the children at the table that they get to decide to put on a scoop or two on their plate. So this, this is the idea that there will be enough there for everyone, but they will need direction. The children would need to say maybe, um, you know, is there enough for everyone here? Have you left enough for, you know, Charlie or Isabel or whoever it is? So this, this is the idea here, save some for your friends. And then after everybody has some, if you've done, you can get more so that they're allowed to have another portion, but make sure everybody gets some. Yes, it's pretty easy. We start at two, in other words, the age two. They will eventually get it and clean up the mess. So I think this is very powerful as well, not ne nearly as powerful as some of the videos, but it's just showing the evidence um, that was collected, um, that's published, um, and that these, some of these facilitators might, might sit uh, quite well. So I'm not going to go through that. That's some of the benefits, again, summarizing them. Um, <clears throat> so the language skills, cooperation, social skills, looking at maths, relationships, not to mention the nutrition as well and the food behaviors, but all of those other things. There, I guess this is where the slowing down at the meal time, that it doesn't have to be just about the food, that they are learning and doing all of these other things as well if they can sit around and take time over, over, the, over the meal. The tips from the practitioners were things like, um, you know, look at it as maybe a teaching moment as well to say, you know, no, we don't grab, use the spoon, or, and reminding them how to do it, that they, they will need help, physically maybe, or verbal cues as well. But I really like this quote, expect mess. So I mean, if paint gets on the floor, you're not going to paint anymore? No, you're still going to paint, but try to help teach them to help you clean the paint. It's the same principle. So I think that's quite nice that you know, you're not gonna stop painting or using sand or those things because it's a bit messy. It's the same with the family style meal service. It will be a bit messy, but, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, and to be, be patient as well. So I'm briefly going to talk about fussy eating. Um, and fussy eating, I suppose, is, it's, it's, I guess, at its highest prevalence between the age of about two and five. Some children at primary school and further on will still be fussy eaters. Um, but I guess it's at its peak at that age when they'll be in your, in your setting. So it's usually an inadequate variety of both familiar and unfamiliar foods. Um, and it ends up being a problem for the parent, the child, or the family relationships. Um, so it can impact on nutrition, certainly, so that because if they're too restrictive on what they're eating, they're obviously not getting a range of nutrients, but it's also linked to um, chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes as well. So there's lots of nutrition-related um, issues in terms of fussy eating. And in terms of the relationships, these are just some of um, quotes taken from papers as well. It causes a lot of stress and, and, and anxiety, particularly if it's very, you know, ongoing a long time. The idea is, I've, you know, I've given up. Um, everybody's tired, people are hungry. It's often an extra workload to, to cook another meal. But sometimes parents do go down that route because they want their child to eat something. Parents have a lot of fear that the child will be hungry, which, which they do not want, because it's almost, um, you know, it's, it's an inert thing that they're there to, to, to feed their child. So we can under, understand that. Um, there's lots of reasons for fussy eating, um, and I'm not going to go through them all. So these are some of them listed here. And so, yes, it will be the child is, is it, the various different factors related to the child. So their age, their gender, the personality, cognition, lots of things will influence whether they will be a fussy eater or not. Similarly with the parents, the parenting feeding style or even their parenting style can impact um, on, on fussy eating and also their own eating habits and their own preferences as well. Um, so lots of things. Uh, so it's not just one thing that we can, we can magically fix. Um, but also if they eat at home themselves at a family style food environment, that can impact whether a child would be a fussy eater or not. But so what could we do to reduce fussy eating? Well, one of the, I suppose, strongest evidence bases is about exposure and repeated exposure again and again and again. And here they've talked about 15 to 20 times that they need to be shown that product maybe once a week, every week for 15 weeks or introduced to it. It should be, if it's the family style service, always there, always available. Um, so exposure is one of the key ones. Now, some of the studies also say this can be, I guess, um, backed up by nutrition education, by talking about foods in storybooks or maybe in playtime. Um, so there are additional things that somebody can do, but the repeated exposure is, is very key. Um, and the children can be exposed to the food obviously through either preparing it, cooking it, growing it, all of those things as well, that they're learning about the food. 
Um, and modelling as well is also very strong. And this could be if the staff are eating with the, the child, so they're modelling that, that good behaviour, eating whatever the, the product might be. Um, and the idea as well, I suppose, is no treats as rewards, um, because it might reinforce the idea that the vegetable is undesirable. And I guess more and more, there's a lot of focus on increasing vegetables because young children, it tends to be the thing that they don't like because fruit is sweet, whereas vegetables can be bitter tasting. Um, and I guess what some of the evidence is also um, trying to suggest, you know, no, not to have any, I guess, emotion related to it, which can be very difficult if your child is not eating with the rest of the family or eating in, in the preschool. And the parents probably bring these um, stories to you and these narratives to you and try to ask you maybe to fix it. Um, and I guess I think this is um, links very much to family style eating in the in the early years. That either it's the parents in this one. This is where the evidence is coming from, but it also relates to staff. They decide what is going to be eaten, so what's going to be served at, at dinner time, when, so in other words, like what time and where, but the child decides how much and whether they're going to eat it. So they're given that responsibility as well. It tends to avoid the conflict, I guess. Um, this, I'm not expecting you to read it, but you'll have it on your slides when they're sent. It's really around learning to like vegetables through sensory learning. As I said, a lot of focus on trying to um, get children to like their vegetables. And this is through things like the sound of the vegetable, what it looks like, even the word when it's said, broccoli or something else, the taste of it, obviously, when it's cooked or when it's raw, um, and the touch and how it's, how it's different, and the, maybe the texture in the mouth. All of these different things are ways, are sensory learning through food, but trying to increase uh, liking of vegetables. Um, I suppose that's the most important about relax. I know I'm getting conscious now we're, we're running out of time. So my last slide is about working with families. And again, this comes from the study that, that I showed you looking at the, the, the barriers and the facilitators for the family style dining. And similarly, those practitioners were asked, you know, what, um, what are the barriers to communication or what might, strategies might you use? And the practitioners were saying, you know, parents are too busy to talk to us. They often offer the unhealthy foods. This is like in the lunchbox, perhaps. Um, but they're also unsure about how to communicate about nutrition uh, without maybe offending parents. Um, and they're also concerned if parents are receptive at all to nutrition education, and, and they may not be. Uh, but strategies, I guess, for communication that were offered and may be useful, um, just recognizing the benefits of communicating with parents about nutrition, that you're doing your part in that to try and, whether it's on a board like we saw or maybe a menu plan or some other way of communicating or maybe some sort of a, an open day at, at the preschool and talking about food. Try and build that relationship um, with the parents. Leverage the policy maybe that you have in your preschool um, or even developing it with the parents would actually be even better um, because then they're invested in it as well and they've been considered. Um, to implement centre level practices to reinforce your policy and I suppose most of all, and this comes back to probably the way you work with, with practitioners anyway, but this was one of the strategies that they suggested was that respectful relationship between the providers and the parents. That there's so much that you can maybe um, either try to educate or, or ask that they, you know, what they send in or not, but you can only do that much. It is always in that respectful um, environment or a respectful relationship. So in summary, early years, ideal setting to promote health. Um, the family style meal times, the fact that they're relaxed, interactive, enjoyable, but they're a learning opportunity as well. Um, and seeing that, I guess, will help us have more time to spend at those meal times. Uh, being a good role model and a positive approach and attitude to food. The idea that we don't have a good or a bad food, um, that there's no judgment or guilt around food, um, and to praise all the effort. Um, but I suppose most of all that small changes at first, um, so whether you decide to use maybe a snack to change that uh, or snack time to do meal service, um, family style meal service at snack time and to take, to take time to see the change. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Santuya who, who's here as well doing her PhD uh, looking at preschools, food and practices in preschools and Hazel another student who's looking at uh, fussy eating. Okay, that's it, many thanks. <laughs>